Hi there, and welcome to Dev Jams. This is our video podcast where we talk with developers who have built interesting and innovative projects using Cloudinary. My name is Jen Brisman, and I am here today without my normal co-host, Sam Brace. And we're here with Amy Dutton. Last time she was here on the show with James Q. Quick. And today we have the good fortune of having her back to talk about a really incredible project that she built for the Redwood JS conference. And Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm especially honored that I am the first repeat guest. So thank you so much. Yes, we're so honored to have you back. This is really awesome. And when we saw your project, we wanted to have you on the show again. And what's nice is now we get to know you as Amy solo. So I wanted to ask you a bit about your background in general, how you got into computing, where you work, your title, all of that good stuff. Awesome. Sounds great. I'm one of those weird ones. I got started in tech when I was very young. My first experience coding was when I was 16. And so I've been doing this for over 20 years now. You can do the math. But <laughs> I am just feel very honored um, and fortunate that I've gotten to almost grow up with tech. And it was a lot easier to get involved in tech when I first started because HTML and CSS looked very different. JavaScript looked very different than it does now. And so as features have been added on, I was able to learn that in order to try and keep up with everything. So now I feel like if you're trying to learn something new, you're just being thrown out into the deep end. So how did you know you wanted to go into tech? I know you said you were 16, but was there someone in your life that maybe inspired you or was it something you picked up in school? Yeah, so I thought that I wanted to do computer animation. I wanted to go work at Disney, do Pixar, and do all those things. But I had the opportunity to code as a job, as my first job. And I would rather be doing that than, say, flipping burgers or folding shirts, doing retail. So nothing against that. In fact, to me, that is super hard work, which is also why I didn't want to do it. <laughs> I was able to just start coding. And some of those experiences that I had when I was 16, I look back and I just think, just how blessed I am. And I'm very appreciative for those opportunities. So I started working at an agency that they just had me answering the phone over the summer. And it, I was really bored to tears most days at work, but there was a guy there that really believed in me. And so he gave me a how to book on HTML. And so I read through that. And so I actually ended up returning the next summer. So that was between my, I think my senior year, and my freshman year in college. And my title was production artist. So I was slicing and dicing websites, doing all the front end work, and they treated me like a full time employee. And after that, I went to school and it was nearby, it was about 45 minutes away. But I'd done so much work over the summer that they needed somebody to fill that gap. But unfortunately, they didn't like the girl that they hired. So they called me and said, What if you just work from the dorm during the week and you come in on Fridays? So I did that and was able to work remotely before working remotely was a thing. But what, so that kind of helped me get into tech and move that forward. And I probably also wouldn't have done that without the influence of my dad. So my family has just always been a family of early adopters. I've always been around computers. In fact, I remember in 92 going to a web conference where my dad spoke about the internet. And I remember asking him about it as we left the conference, just not understanding what the World Wide Web was and envisioning spiders and things like that. Just those early uh, moments of influence really helped me get on that path. And then I did go on and do radio TV broadcasting in college because I was still on the animation path, but realized that, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. The people that are working on those movies are in some cases just glorified freelancers. So they'll work really hard on a particular film and then they have to find the next film that they want. And I just didn't think that's what I wanted for me or for our family. And so I had such a fantastic background in web that and I knew that I loved it. That's where I wanted to go. Oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I love that we got to hear about how animation was a driving force early in your life and how we're going to talk about animation in the project. Yeah. today. But also how you said your family is early adopters and not yeah. that to be on the cutting edge of tech. Like you really have to be an early adopter of everything to keep up with all that's being developed all the time. And I also just love that that you're an artist and that's your background. And you are one of those interesting people in tech that you're a developer, but you also have a design background and you don't see that all the time. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, something that makes you really special and Thank why, you. yeah, and, and why it's so exciting to hear about what we're going to talk about later today. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your job now at Redwood and what that's like and what you see yourself 
doing in the future and kind of hear about your career. Yeah, sure. So I work on the Redwood JS core team. I'm part of their leadership team as a maintainer. And this job is completely different than any other job that I've had before. Most of the other jobs that I've had have been with agencies. In fact, I think everything that I've done has been with an agency. The last job that I had was a little bit of staff augmentation. So what that means is if a company needed a developer or a designer, they would call us and we would give them one of our people to almost sit on their team for however long they needed us. It was agency work, but there was also a product component to it, especially if you ended up working on a project or a product more long term. So this is a little bit different now that I'm working on open source. We're not trying to make money off of Redwood, which is completely different when you're trying to talk about, okay, what do you add to a project? Because you're not talking about dollars or how much will this feature make for us. You're talking about what does the community need and where can they see the value, but also where is the industry going and what trends do we need to be aware of or what are roadblocks for other people that are using Redwood? So it's a completely different mind shift. And so far, I've really enjoyed it. So how did you get involved with Redwood initially? Yeah, so I also host a podcast. You mentioned that in the intro. And we had David Price, who is one of the founders of Redwood, come on as a guest. He was actually I think our, the second guest that we ever had on the show. And so in an interview, much like this, he sat down and pitched me Redwood and said, what do you think about this? And of course, he already had it built, but just the way that he pitched it. What would you think if you ran a single com command and storybook just worked? Where you ran a single command and all of a sudden you didn't have to do any set up for testing just worked. And I was like, I'm so sold. <laughs> Where yeah. no, What is this? And so after our interview, I ended up working through the tutorial that is still in the documentation for Redwood site and was all in. I think that happened in about February or March in June. I went to Prisma Day in Germany and actually spoke on Redwood and all that it had to offer. Three or four months later, I'm totally sold. We'll be talking about Prisma today in this episode and Redwood. But one more question before we go in is Redwood's open source. And I just wanted to ask you what you like most about working open source and what your experience leading to this point has been on your journey as a developer with open source. Yeah, I think my favorite part about open source is just feeling like I'm able to give back into the community. So in terms of Redwood itself, it's been around for four years and we have mostly focused on startups in the past. That's been just the people that have become our people. Not that we don't want everybody, but it's just the people that get it the fastest so far. And they've raised over $70 million in uh, funding for the projects that they've created on Redwood. And so the fact that I get to help contribute to core infrastructure for somebody that is betting literally their life and their business on a product, that just feels really good, especially for someone that has been in the industry for a while and has given so much to me just the ability to give back has been huge. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I think that's probably a good segue to talk about your project, what you built. And I'd love to just first hear a high level overview of what you built for Redwood JS and why we have you here today. Yeah, sure. So we had our first Redwood conference in September, and I had seen a couple of similar services or badge apps or websites that like Next.js has done for their conference and really wanted to do something similar as a marketing thing to raise awareness for the conference, but in this case also provide a free virtual ticket or a discount on the in-person ticket. And so the general flow is that a user will get a link and this link is shared out through one of our partners. So we have 35 partners that we created codes for. We have more partners than that, but these are companies that we have integrated with. So we've mentioned Prisma a couple of times. That would be a prime example of a partner or there's other services like flight control or defer uh, that we also partner with to make sure that we're integrated with well. What a user would do is they would receive a link from a partner and they would go to that link. Now that link that they get is a dynamic page in the sense that it's loading in the title. So it says, hey, Prisma invited you to, and it has Prisma's code and Prisma's discount amount. And so when the user enters their email, then that that's submitting the form that gets added to our database and they'll immediately get an email. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of the tech, but the email is getting sent out through Resend, which is a fantastic service as well. 
And then they're prompted to connect to GitHub. So they don't necessarily have to connect to GitHub. They're still going to get that discount for the free virtual ticket. But if they connect to GitHub, then we're able to pull just their public information. We're not asking for anything else, but we get their avatar, their name, their company, their location. And then we're able to stick that onto a badge. So they have a customized badge that displays all of that information. And from there, they can either download that badge. They can share a link out with someone else saying, hey, I just signed up. Here's my badge. Or they can tweet about it or add it to the calendar. So there's a few other options there. What's interesting is there's only three or four pages that the user sees on the front end. But then there's a whole set of functionality on the back end in order to make that work. So there's also a whole admin panel for being able to add codes for speakers and partners really easily. I can also see who had the most successful link shares or where people were coming from. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot that you can track there as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's talk about everything in your stack and then we'll get to talking under the hood and how this all works together. Perfect. So it is running Redwood. I didn't feel comfortable building an application for the Redwood conference that wasn't actually built on Redwood. Yeah. So it is built on Redwood. And if people are thinking, man, I've never even heard of Redwood, what all is involved. This was a huge selling point for me. It actually takes several that I would have picked anyways and bundles them all up together. So you don't have to worry about trying to manage updates and trying to connect all the things and configurations. It does all that for you. Plus, if any of those things upgrade, you're able to upgrade your Redwood project. As a Redwood team, we manage all of those dependencies for you and tell you, hey, this changed or this changed. You don't have to do that yourself or figure out why did this suddenly break or I don't want to ever upgrade my project because I don't know what's going on. It's nice that you have a team, you have a support system that does all that for you. As a bundle, we have React, GraphQL, Prisma, Storybook, and Jest, and JavaScript testing library as part of that. Uh, It also has TypeScript support, which you can either enable or not, depending on your personal preference. So if anything in your stack needs to be updated, Redwood takes care of all of that. So what does that involve for a user? Do they need to go back to Redwood, make sure things are updated? Is there something they could run in the CLI that updates? Sure. So if I added on like an extra package, like I'm a huge fan of the date functions library, if I add that in, we're not going to catch that. But in terms of like core Redwood functionality, if GraphQL updated, if Prisma updated, if Jest or Storybook, if any of those upgrades happen, when you go to run your Redwood project in the terminal, it'll say, hey, you have an upgrade of Redwood. Would you like to upgrade? And then I'll just say run this command. And so I've also upgraded the badge app a couple of times and it's fantastic. You just run the command and then everything is still working, which is fantastic. The team does a fantastic job of trying to minimize those breaking changes. Uh, what were you going to say before when I interrupted you? <laughs> <laughs> You're totally fine. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit more about some of the other tech aside from Redwood. So there. I said aside from Redwood, this is still technically part of Redwood. We have an experimental feature called Redwood Studio, and we can actually demo that later. But I'm using Recent to send out all of the mail that goes with that. And Redwood provides a nice interface for being able to work with that and manage it. I'm also using server-side rendering, which is a new feature for Redwood. Redwood has historically been a SPA or a single page application. And so with the server-side rendering, you're able to get the most out of open graph images. Sometimes that's not always a problem if you're running, say, like an application or it's behind a login. But in this case, we have public marketing pages that we want the Google and Yahoo and Bing and all those services to be able to access that metadata. And we're also using Neon Database to store all of the information, which they have a fantastic service where you can branch your databases, which is really great if you have a production set of data and staging data. Then we're also hosting on fly.io and I'm using GreenSock or maybe you've seen a GSAP, GSAP for all the animations. Yeah, so this is really involved. There's a lot going on here and and Cloudinary obviously is a part of this stack. How could I forget? I'm so sorry. (laughs) So embarrassing. (laughs) What What is a given? Yeah, of course. Exactly. That was a given. So when you <laughs> get how this all works together, we'll see how Cloudinary fits in there. But it's amazing how much is involved. And I think what I was originally drawn to when we saw your project was the flashy badge, of course, and the animation that goes into it. But there's so much more to what mm-hmm. you built and all the logic behind the emails and everything that goes into that. So we'll get a chance to look at all of that, I hope. Today. Yes. 
Okay, so let's talk about Prisma. Had you worked with Prisma for databases and, and migrations before? Or was this a first? What's yeah, so I actually spoke at Next.js Conf last fall on Prisma, talking about connecting a Next.js project with Prisma. So if you're not familiar with Prisma, what it does is it is a database ORM. That you can interact with your database. It gives you a nice API without you having to write SQL calls. So we all know now that I've been doing web development for 20 years. I've had to write SQL calls and it's painful. <laughs> I hate writing left joins and trying to figure out where clauses. And Prisma yeah. gives you a nice API that makes it really simple to be able to do that and abstracts that layer and handles all those connections for you. Wow. Okay, cool. I'm interested <laughs> in checking out Prisma myself. And then let's talk about HTML and coding those email templates and how you found that Tailwind wrapper that made everything easier and Resend and, and how all of that works together. Yeah, so Resend is a fantastic product. You should definitely check it out if you haven't heard of it. But Zeno, the founder of it, really has an attention to detail. And one of the things that he has used to really set his company apart is design and user experience and UI. So from my background, you know that resonates with me. One of his things, though, if you go to the website, is he wants you to be able to get up and running with mailing within a weekend. He wants to make that email experience as smooth as possible. And it's really an interesting business concept because email has been around forever. And that's the thing that he's like all in and trying to make that process and that workflow as smooth as possible. And that's so true with email. If you start looking at the APIs, you can tell how really well designed it all is. And we have used Recent to hook into Redwood Studio to be able to send out an email. There's a couple of painful parts that I found when I'm trying to send email in the past on other projects. You have the actual design of the email and trying to code it. It's just painful. Uh, a lot of the platforms don't support the tags that we love that make coding in a browser much easier. So for example, the flex tag, the grid tag, you don't have access to that with an email. But Recent Labs has created a wrapper that you can just use Tailwind tags directly within your email code, and it will generate the code that it needs to be able to work on all those platforms. So we, I was able to use that within the emails that we were sending out. Then Redwood Studio has a viewer. So if you send out an email, a lot of times you're trying to figure out, did it go to spam? Is it in trash? Do I have the most updated email? Well, with Redwood Studio, if you're on your developer server, it recognizes that you're in dev mode and it will grab that email so that you can preview it. It also has a nice interface for being able to preview your templates. And so it's the best experience that I've ever had in terms of having to code out email and get them sent out. Okay, let's take a quick look at the Redwood Studio here so you can show what you're talking about. Yeah, so this is the mail sync. So this is what actually grabs that email that you're sending out. And if I click on this, you can see that it shows you the HTML that someone is getting for a particular email. Then it also shows you the text version, so you don't have to guess or try and figure that out or send out two different versions of that. You can see the raw HTML, which looks like code, any metadata that goes along with it, but you can also see attachments. So for example, we sent out a calendar invite with the email that you can even download here from the mail sync. It also has a template preview, so this particular project, we only have one template that we're using, but you can see here's the ticket email. And this is really just a React component. So you can see these are the props that I'm passing in. And then that dynamic data gets included within the email. So when I'm coding out the email, I can just pull it up here within Redwood Studio and code out the email. And you can see changes updated immediately as I'm making them. That's so nice. Okay, cool. So let's Quickly chat about how Cloudinary comes into this. What problem did working with Cloudinary solve for you? So Cloudinary was fantastic. I have to have a way to actually store the images that I'm uploading for the badge, whether that's the speakers, or the partners, or their logos. But also, as we're grabbing this information from GitHub and displaying that in the badge, I have to be able to store those somewhere. Let me just actually show the badge so you can see how that works. But this particular logo here, Redwood JS, this is dynamic, so that's in the database, and that's being served by Cloudinary. And then you can click and drag the badge and swing it, which is really fun. And then once you add your information, actually, I can go ahead and add mine here. I think I'm already in the database. 
Yep, I'm in. And then I can customize my ticket. So that'll ask me to authenticate through GitHub. And I was already authenticated, so it didn't have me go through the official process. But you can see it pulled in my name, my personal company, AHA Creative, and then it has my avatar. So pretty cool. On the back end, this is where we have all the speakers. So you can see here's all their avatars and their codes that we created for them. You can also see the number of uses that each one got. And then I just put quick, quick links here for me as I was trying to share out those pages and communicate that with our speakers. So if I click on add a speaker and want to add a speaker here, then I could just drag and drop their avatar here. And that gets uploaded to Cloudinary to be included on the page. We also had a page for our partners. And it's the same thing here, except we're using logos instead of avatars. Awesome. Okay, so how do you get those images um, that are on the badges? We know from their GitHub avatars, from their GitHub profiles, through that authentication. But where does, where does Cloudinary come into that part? So as soon as we authenticate with GitHub in the code, and we can pull that in, up and look at it if you want. Okay, so once we grab the image from GitHub, then I go ahead and upload that image to Cloudinary. And Cloudinary gives me a URL and I save that into the database. So I can share that code with you so you can see exactly what that looks like. So <laughs> here is the URL we have, we're calling a Cloudinary API call. And I'm using an environmental variable that has my API key that is secret and hidden. But then it's taking that information and it's appending it to the form that gets submitted. And you can see here, I'm making a fetch call to post all of that information. Now that we see how Cloudinary fits into this, let's look under the hood at some of the technical elements that you showed in the functionality demo before. Sure, so I also have a custom upload component. So we were talking about that drag and drop piece. Yeah. So if I go into the admin folder here, and all of this is open source, if you want to take a look at it, I have a custom upload form field that I created. And you can see here that I'm sending that particular image to Cloudinary. And this is a drag and drop field that I created. Okay, so this is the upload component. Or no, this is the upload field area. Mm -hmm. so. This is the upload component that is actually part of the form field. So if you're trying to upload an avatar or a logo, this is where this goes. There's a few other cases where I am using Cloudinary. For example, the open graph image. That one's a little, it's an interesting piece of text. I wanted to create a custom image that I could use to send out when I send out the link. So if it said, if I created my own link, it, then when I sent it out, it would say Amy Dutton and Redwood JS invite you to their conference. In order to do that, I basically created just an HTML page. That was easy for me because then I could just style it with Flexbox and Grid and pull directly from the database. I have my React components. And then I'm using a service called API Flash. And I believe all that they're really doing is, say, using a Lambda server to create a Playwright instance that will take a screenshot of my HTML page. And I could control the dimensions of that. And then once I have that image, I could upload the image to Cloudinary if I wanted to save it. And then that way, every time somebody shares out the image, it's not having to regenerate that screenshot with API Flash. It's not increasing my API calls. That image is ready on the, that image is, I was about to say image is ready on the ready. <laughs> <laughs> that image is immediately yeah. ready to be able to send out and for somebody to be able to view, which is great. If you have a viral link that goes out, you don't want that running up your API calls. And the fact that Cloudinary can handle all that bandwidth easily is a huge plus. Okay, cool. So let me see if I understand. So when you go through this create process, it uses the API flash to create that image or grab a screenshot of that image from your HTML page. And then, then it gets uploaded to Cloudinary and then Cloudinary delivers that, that That's OG right. like tag or That's that right. OG So image. we can pull up, this is the API side. So this is the back end where I'm grabbing that image using API flash. And you can see I'm passing in the width and the height. I did delay it just because I didn't want there to be, say, a loading state that it's trying to capture. I want to make sure that it had time to load. But then just like the other code that we looked at with the upload field, it's posting that data to Cloudinary to be able to get it. And then on the front end, I have a OG participant cell. And this is what is the, basically the HTML page that generates that. So what's interesting about Redwood is that if you're working with React components 
and you're grabbing data, you usually have several states that you have to take into account. You have a loading state, you have an empty state, you have a failure state and a success state. And so you have to go in and check for all of those things. And that can actually be a lot of code, a lot of boilerplate code, especially if you're making several calls. One of the things that makes Redwood is this concept of a cell. And this is a GraphQL query where I'm saying, hey, go to the database and grab the participant. Here's all the data that I need from it. And then it will determine, is it a loading state? Is it an empty state? And you could pass in React components if you wanted, but I don't have to write all those conditionals. It will just deliver the correct component based on what that state is. So then down here is the success state. So that was one of the reasons when we looked at that snippet of code and I had the delay of three seconds right here because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to show a loading state and that it would have time to actually get that data and plug that in. So now we've grabbed all that data. We have the badge. How does it work to display the badge or download the badge? How does everybody get their badge? Yeah, so with the downloaded badge, API Flash will actually generate that image and provide that to you. So all I'm doing there is I'm just providing the link. I made a few assumptions there. I figured if somebody is going to download their badge, they're probably only going to do that once, maybe twice. Maybe they'll go back to the site and re-download it, but it's only going to happen once or twice. So I don't need to necessarily save that information. But for an OG tag, I mentioned this earlier, if that link goes viral, I don't want to have to create it a million times. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm creating that image and then I'm sending that over to Cloudinary and then it just becomes a URL within my database. I have my API flash call and then here is Cloudinary. So then it just takes this file and appends it to the form and then passes it up to Cloudinary and then I can also stick that within the database. Great. Okay. When you say stick that within the database, are you talking about? Right. There's two different databases. Technically, there's the Cloudinary database and then there's my database that's on Neon. So when I send it to Cloudinary, Cloudinary will give me a URL and that URL is what goes in my database. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Now that we've talked about how a lot of this works, unless I'm missing anything, I'd love to look at the animation and how you got that all to work because I noticed that the badge moves and that's really cool and creative and awesome. And that's the shiny part that got me interested in looking at all of this other stuff as well. But how did you make that animation work? And also what inspired you to have an animated badge? I'm trying to remember where the inspiration came from. I think it happened because I have hanging from my wall all of the conferences that I've been to within the last couple of years, all the badges are there. I also have some on my door. And so anytime my kids come in and out of the door, the badges are swinging. And I think I was just thinking about the application and seeing these badges swing that made me think, wow, wouldn't that be cool if the badge was actually swinging or pullable, draggable on the website? Oh my gosh, that's so that's cool. cool. And it's not just that it moves or like does like... um you know, it's like shaking or something. It actually swings like from the uh, from the lanyard. So yeah, let's let's look at that. To share this, I'm actually going to share a code pen. And one of the reasons why is because there's a lot happening in order to make that animation work. And anytime I'm trying to figure out something complicated like that, I try and break it down. So let's isolate that one little piece and figure out that one piece before I try and figure out how do I implement this into the site. So. This is a very dumbed down, rudimentary looking badge, but it has all of the elements that is actually on the site. So if you look at, say, like the HTML, this is a div with a wrapper. And then this is an SVG for the lanyard piece. And then I also have just a, a div for the badge itself. And then if you look at the CSS, it's really just... To for the wrapper to place that on the screen to make sure that's snapped at the top. And then all the magic happens within the JavaScript. So I'm using GreenSock, or if you've seen it as GSAP, GSAP. It's a really popular library or framework. It's been around forever. In fact, in the days of Flash, it was really popular. And then they've pivoted over to JavaScript. And they have quite a bit of functionality that make creating animations like this really simple. So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm creating a constant to hold all of the different pieces that I have to work with. It's a lot easier to reference something as front cord than trying to grab that as the ID document dot get element by ID cord front every single time. So once I've established that, GreenSock has this concept of a timeline so that you can pause or start a timeline. 
and do different things on the timeline. In fact, you can even reverse the timeline. I'm starting out with it paused. So one of the things that the timeline lets me do is I don't think it's doing it in the demo, but if you look on the live site, it'll twitch a little bit just so somebody knows, hey, you can actually do something with this because it's almost like an Easter egg. It's something that you have to discover, but you have to at least like tease people a little bit just so that they know that something can be done there. So that's what's happening with the timeline. Then what I'm doing here is I'm controlling the coordinates for the cord. So this is the top left if it's TL. And then I'm checking to see what the the coordinates of the badge are. So if we come on down, Greensock has a library called Draggable. And so I'm saying here that I want my badge to be draggable. And I'm creating some bounds. So it's not going to drag outside of the wrapper. You can actually drag it way off the window if you want. But I'm saying I want it all contained. And then when I press, I'm telling it what that starting point is. So I'm setting those values. And then when I drag it, it's updating what those values are. And then it's going to animate the bottom coordinates of the cord itself so that they stretch. And if you look at the site, it, they are stiff. If you actually have a lanyard, there'll be some give in it. This one doesn't. But they're stiff, but it is going to stretch based on what you set there with your coordinates. You can see I'm setting it to the top center. So depending on how far you pull the badge, are we seeing something different? This is so cool. So all it's doing is it's changing these bottom coordinates to line up here. So when I pull, it's uh-huh. checking to see what those coordinates are and it's updating whenever I move it just based on Green Sox library to be able to set what those points are. So there's really no animation on my end. It's smart enough to say, hey, update these points to wherever I'm dragging it. Wow. Okay, cool. So if someone were to be watching this and want to do something like this on their own, do you have any tips or any are there any roadblocks you ran into or is there a template that you use to get you started? Yeah, so a couple of things. I was a little bit intimidated by this myself. I had an idea for it and then trying to figure out, which is one of the reasons why I leaned into CodePen. I would just say do a piece of it at a time. In fact, if you look at my CodePen, there's a few like stale code pens there where I tried different tactics. Like I tried something with Framer. I tried, let's just animate the badge so you can drag the badge everywhere around the page. It doesn't snap back, but and the cord just stays there. But it gives you an idea. You hear the old adage, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Well, that's how <laughs> you should approach code is just take it one bite at a time, one step at a time. And then once you figure that out, you can go on to the next piece. Is the first part you figured out just getting it there, maybe the twitch that came maybe with this draggable option or? Yeah, sorry, so the, yeah you're good. So the first thing that I tried to figure out was, okay, let me drag the badge. How do I drag the badge? Yep. And it doesn't snap back at all. It just, how do I drag it? And yep. then, and with that, I was able to learn, do I want it to go off the screen? How do I set the boundaries on that? How far? And then the next piece is, okay, how do I attach the cord to that? How do I make sure the coordinates on the cord line up with the badge so that every time that I drag it, it follows along. And then the third piece of that is once I release. So actually, if you come down on the code, you can see on release, this should happen. And I've set the home state where I want the badge to go back to. It'll automatically snap back to that. And then the coordinates for the strap need to update. And then you also need to figure out the timing. So that you can play with a little bit, but you don't want it to be super fast so that it's like, wow, that's not natural. But you don't want it to be super slow either because then it just doesn't feel snappy. And again, it, that doesn't feel natural either. Yeah. Yeah. Like you want it to, to, to be natural and go with the like inertia or whoever something right. moves or the timing. Yeah. The other thing, if you're trying to figure stuff out is to see, okay, is there somebody else that has created something similar? And Jay, who is now at Vercel, has all kinds of crazy code pins on his account. He used to be a developer at Google, and his job was really just to push the boundaries of the browser, to advocate for new properties and to show people how they work. So on his code pin, he has all kinds of crazy demos for different things. He creates a lot of demos to show how the browser works and how you can implement these new CSS and JavaScript features directly within the browser. So one of his code pens, uh, and his code pens are just fantastic in general, but he has this impossible light bulb with green sock. Cool. 
if you check out this demo and we can include the direct link to it, but if you pull the light switch, then the bear will come out and try and keep turning off the light. So you can never flip it on and leave it on. But you'll notice that there are a lot of the same elements there. I don't have a bear. I don't have a door. I don't have sound, but I do have a element that I'm trying to drag and then release and have it snap back into place. Nice. This is so cool. So this part partly inspired like you're seeing your badges on your wall and on the doors when it opened and closed. That's what got you the idea. But then maybe seeing this code helped you get started and, and see what you could do with this. Yeah, that's right. Now, his implementation is slightly different. So he just has a single stroke here where I had the two cords coming down. But just going through the code and being able to turn things on and off. So turn off the bear, turn off the door. And because you have the code right here in CodePen in front of you, you can play with values to see, okay, how can I mimic or get similar functionality in what I'm trying to do? Were there any roadblocks that you encountered during this animation or really anywhere else in your process of building this really cool app? Oh, thanks. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I always, for, for better or worse, try and put something challenging into any project that I'm working on. Not that anybody asks, but that's what makes a project interesting to me and keeps me engaged. It mm -hmm. can be frustrating, yes, but it is also exciting and it feels really good when you're able to pull it off in the end. So yes, the animation was hard. It was something that I had to figure out. The OG tag that we talked about was hard. Not only just trying to figure out the API flash, which was not crazy, but really working with Twitter. Twitter is going through a few changes right now where and how they're handling OG tags. So if you have not looked at open graph tags, Twitter has its own syntax that it uses for open graph tags. And even right now, as we speak, Elon is changing that and changing how those are handled. So trying to test that on top of not only getting it to work, but testing it was really hard. So Twitter mm -hmm. has testing tools, but they don't work anymore. And mm -hmm. trying to figure out, okay, what is the API for that side? Is that something that we continue to pursue? How much time do we stick into it? So those are probably the biggest challenges. And then the last question I'll ask, is there anything you learned along the way that you might be applying to your future work or anything worth sharing to any of our listeners? Yeah, I would just say, one, if you do take that challenge of trying to add hard things into your project, just remember everything is figure outable. Take it one step at a time. But also, and this is a huge thing, is as much as you can try and share in public. Not only does that help other developers, but it like in this case, I'm able to have this interview, able to talk about the project and things like that. And none of that would have happened if I hadn't have shared in public. Yeah, that's such a great way to learn is seeing what other people have done in the same way that you saw this impossible light bulb and you built what you built. Now you've shared, you've put it out there. It's open source to remind anyone that's listening. So you can look at what Amy's built and maybe build something, iterate, make yeah, something sure. different. Yeah, yeah, and that's another thing I was thinking about is badges are a very common need for for conferences really mm -hmm. like conference needs a badge have you thought about next steps for what you've built and if maybe other conferences could use some of your code here yeah so it is open source so if there is a conference organizer that's listening you can take the code use it and modify it to whatever you need it to be i'm happy to provide any insight if you have a stumbling block along the way but there's a few other features that in my mind weren't finished not on the user side, but we mentioned all the tooling that's on the back end. There are certain things that I wanted to do, like I created a poor man's way to be able to export out all the participants so that we huh. could contact them during the conference and be able to give them information during the conference. But that would have been nice if it clicked a button and you download it instead of this just copy and drag this giant text box. But yeah. those are features just for me that I would like to see. The other side of it is it's created some great content. So as we've talked about, it led to this podcast, but also there are other things I want to write about to explain more into detail how the code works, the nitty gritty of try this or don't try this or this worked and this didn't work because I always enjoy those. And I hope that other people would enjoy and get insight out of that content as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the way that we found out that you built this project is we saw the blog that you wrote about um, your journey writing this mm -hmm. project. So we'll share that link right here um, in the chat now. Um, so make sure to check that out. You might learn something that we didn't get the chance to talk about on this episode today. Um, but yeah, writing about it, putting it out there, um, helping others. It's like my my favorite theme to bring up every single Dev Jams episode essentially is how developers helping other developers leads to growth. And that has to always keep happening. And thank you so much for being one of those people that is keeping that happening. 
And I also wanted to plug Compressed. Amy and James Q. Quick, you just have to say the whole name. It's just such a cool name. Have this uh, podcast called Compressed. Amy, if you wanted to do just a quick plug while we're here about Compressed. Yeah. So Compressed is a podcast that I've co-hosted for the last few years. And we talk about web design and development with a little bit of zest. In fact, if you listen to the intro, it's a rap that James did, uh, which is always fun. But (laughs) in fact, uh, we were on the previous Dev Jams episode because we are doing some fun things with Cloudinary within the website. So you should also check out that particular episode. Yes. And we've actually had Brad Garapy on the show as well. And I think he's involved in some way. I don't know if it's released yet with Compressed. That's right. So actually, I need to add it to the website as we're talking about it. But he is our official third co-host. So I'm a big fan of Brad and all that he's contributed to the community as well. And we were tagging him a lot to help co-host anytime that James and I were out. And so we just decided to make it official. Well, obviously, we're big fans of Brad as well as you, Amy, and James. So this is really awesome that you've given us your time today and come back on Dev Jams. We're so lucky to have you. I hope everyone listening has gotten a lot of cool info out of this episode. And I just wanted to plug Dev Jams really quick. I know you're listening, but as always, we have tons of episodes, ones that you can find Amy and James. There's a cool search feature. I can probably just type in Amy and find Look at that Uh, episode there with James. Pretty cool. So this is a previous episode that we've had here. So as always, we have many podcasts that you can check out here. We're always delivering these. And one more thing that we wanted to mention is we have an awesome Cloudinary community at community.cloudinary.com. We have a Discord you can join. And this is a place where we have Cloudinary users as well as Cloudinarians, employees that work at Cloudinary here to help and support you. And it's also a cool way to see what other developers are doing using Cloudinary. Amy, thank you so much for your time. We hope maybe there's another situation in the future where we can have you back on Dev Jams. But for now, I'll keep an ear to the ground for everything you're up to with Redwood and all else that you're up to. So thank awesome. you so much. Thank and you. And we'll see you next time, hopefully. Come <laughs>